So good afternoon to you all. Thank you for attending this second webinar from our fourth webinar cycle entitled Is Sustainable the New Healthy? Before we start, I'll share a few information about how this webinar runs. For further viewing, we are recording this session, so if you do not wish to appear, you can turn off your cameras. Our speakers have a 15-minute presentation followed by Q&A. You can feel free to post your questions in the Teams chat. This webinar should be finished by 5.30 p.m. Lisbon time. Before we start, I invite you to check our website as we will have a busy summer with several events taking place like EIT Food Summer School, Grow Workshops and the Feel Local all taking place this July. I am Cecilia Franco, me and my colleague Catarina Moncelos, we are both nutritionists and health and well-being specialists at Food for Sustainability. Catarina, she will be joining us shortly as she is now presenting her master thesis on food systems governance. So let's wish her good luck. So last week, last week we addressed the impact of our food choices and eating patterns on the environment, health and society. What does entails in a transition to a sustainable and healthy diet? Do we have the appetite for change? Are we nutritionists doing everything we can to promote sustainable and healthy eating habits? Today, we will be exploring practical examples of how to promote the concept of a sustainable and healthy diet through school meals, pub public food procurement and food education. Can school meals impact and promote an effective change? How can we educate and motivate the next generation to eat healthy and sustainable? And next week, it will be our last webinar. We will finish the cycle with a focus on product and services development, willing to understand the main challenges and innovation solutions, innovative solutions companies are developing to embrace a sustainable food transition. I will now show you this short video. It was produced by the Spanish Foundation of Dietitians and Nutritionists. It's a teaser, small video, for a full doc documentary about sustainable eating. We will not be seeing the full video, the full documentary, only a teaser, but it will for sure leave us with a hunger for change. So let's look at the document, the, the short video. Quando eu tomo uma opção tão simples como escolher um produto fresco ou um produto processado, eu estou a ter um impacto no meio ambiente. A maior parte das pessoas talvez não, não compreenda à primeira vista. No entanto, ter um produto que vem congelado, que viajou milhares de quilómetros para ser mantida aquela temperatura. E ter um produto que é do meu redor, à minha volta, sem transporte, sem embalagem, os impactos ambientais são completamente diferentes. Meat is one of the most important decisions you make. In fact, there's evidence to show that switching from a meat heavy diet to a semi vegetarian diet can be as effective of, as switching the type of car you drive. También nos dimos cuenta que se estaban realizando tratamientos para el control de plagas y enfermedades que no eran necesarios. Es decir, que muchas veces simplemente dejando trabajar a la naturaleza por sí misma, ella era capaz de controlar a esas plagas y también a esas enfermedades. Lehen iketa behin gure etorkizunarekin eta gure bizitzarekin zer egin behar genuen, erabaki behar genuen, hau da zertaz bizi behar ginen, eta esan dudan bezala, bueno, garbi geneukan gure izaerari jarraipide bat eman behar geniola, eta hartzaintzak eskutintzen zigun aukera hori. 
No, no creo que los gobiernos hagan lo posible para, para, para promo, promover una alimentación sostenible. Los criterios que utilizan a día de hoy y cualquiera de los gobiernos que estamos viendo son todo claves económicas, no son claves sociales. Um, the full uh, documentary can be accessed both both by reaching the producers, um, the first um, uh, link over there, also or also the Portuguese Association of Nutrition through their sustainable eating program. I will also share the links in the team's chat shortly. So we nutritionists, we have a decisive role in disseminating healthy and sustainable food practices. We also must walk the talk and for this reason I will share how I am committing to walking the talk. So today for lunch I ate uh, some yesterday's leftovers uh, so to reduce the food waste and for, for dinner I already cooked some organic tofu and spinach pot pie which I have it here because I'm working from home. It is here <laughs> right beside me. Uh, I, it is, it is um, uh, a modification to a tuna recipe where I swapped the tuna for the tofu and added some fresh, fresh spinach. So, and this leads me to trying to um, define a sustainable, healthy eater profile, um, we may say. So, a healthy, sustainable a sustainable healthy eater might be someone who buys small quantities of fresh ingredients each time to prevent food waste, someone who buys preferably organic, local and in-season foods, brings a vegan or a vegetarian dish to the Sunday family lunch or family's parties, such, uh, which means someone who is brave enough to bring some different dish, someone who includes legumes and tofu or seitan dishes to their kids' meals. Even if they might say no in the first time, in the beginning, we should try to present those uh, ingredients um, several times and in, uh, so they can become um, a reality and a habit. Give vegetables the lead role when naming their dishes, opposite to naming the, the meat or the fish first, and someone who walks the talk and willing to be a spokesperson. So in our session today, I believe we will be having three sustainable, healthy eaters. I hope so. So starting with Jui Ene. Jui will be pr uh, presenting us transforming canteens for a delicious revolution with both French and Japanese heritage. He grew up in, a French, in, in France on a family-run organic farm, which has been environmentally, socially and economically sustainable for 30 years. Then after graduate, graduating from Sciences Po Paris in political science, he joined Collective Les Pieds dans le Plat, Nourrir l'Avenir, Feeding the Future, a proposed-driven collective of passionate cooks and nutritionists who transform canteens by using 100% organic, local, fresh and seasonal food. I will present uh, our speakers um, uh, at this moment. We will then follow um, Katie Wilson, System Changes in School Food. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Dietetics, a Master's degree in Food Science and Nutrition and a Doctoral degree in Food Service and in Lodging Management. She has a passion for child nutrition and has dedicated her career to improving access to healthy food for all children and their families. And she is considered one of the top experts in the field of child nutrition. She has spent 23 years as a school nutrition director, five years as the executive director for the Institute of Child Nutrition, two years as the deputy under secretary of food, nutrition and consumer services 
at the United States Department of Agriculture, appointed by President Obama, and is presently the executive director of the Urban School Food Alliance. Lastly, we will have Margarida Gomes. She has a degree in geography, a diploma of advanced studies in territory, environment and sustainable development. She worked as a teacher in secondary education, having dynamized various projects in the environmental nuclei at school. Since 2000, she coordinates environmental education programs for sustainability in the European Blue Flag, uh, Blue Flag Association addressed to various targeted audiences like Eco Schools, Young Reporters for the Environment and Eco 21, a project which she is the author. Welcome to all our speakers. I uh, will pass the floor to Jui Ene. Welcome. You can share. You can now start sharing your screen. Yes, thank you. Thank uh, you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. So I'm Joey Ene and uh, I'm the director of Nourir L'Avenir, which is a social cooperative transforming canteens into 100% organic, fresh and local products. And we are based in France, but we are more and more um, implicated in projects around internationally, also in Europe. So we, I'm very happy to be here. And I will start the presentation uh, by a video, two minute video presenting uh, who we are. Une restauration collective, sociale, bio, locale, faite maison, de saison et pas plus cher, cela donne envie, n'est-ce pas Eh bien c'est possible et nous savons le faire. Chaque jour, partout en France, le tandem collectif les pieds dans le plat, qui nourrir l'avenir, le prouve. Nous sommes des cuisiniers, des diététiciens, des ingénieurs, des parents d'élèves, des gestionnaires, des chefs d'établissements scolaires, des collectivités, des chercheurs. Tous engagés pour que souffle le vent du changement dans les cantines. Tous ces défis, le collectif Les Pieds dans le Plat vous aide à les relever. Crèche, école primaire, collège, lycée, EHPAD, établissement de santé, nous intervenons pour vous aider à former et souder les équipes en cuisine autour du fait maison. Orientez vos achats vers les agriculteurs bio locaux, favorisez les fruits, légumes, viande bio et de saison accompagner les mangeurs et éduquer les enfants et les adultes au goût et à l'alimentation durable. C'est bon pour la santé, c'est bon pour l'économie locale, c'est bon pour la planète et c'est bon pour les équipes qui travaillent dans et autour de la cuisine. Depuis 2015, le collectif a ainsi formé plus de 6000 cuisiniers et cuisinières de collectivités. Deux formules au moins sont possibles. Un accompagnement complet, du diagnostic à l'immersion, des interventions thématiques autour de la cuisine végétarienne, de la cuisson des céréales, des légumineuses ou encore les assaisonnements. Les membres du collectif et de la SKIC Nourrir l'Avenir sont présents dans toutes les régions de France, prêts à vous rencontrer. Can you see now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, we, yes, we can see. So I'm talking. Um, I'm going to present and talk about uh, the subject of organic canteens, which can be a great lever for a delicious uh, revolution. Um, so first, we, the collective I represent. So we are 40 cooks and nutritionists, but also engineers all around France. Um, we were engaged from the question of uh, uh, what children eat at school and we think it's a very interesting uh, first question to approach a whole lot of other subjects around the, the, the subject of canteens. So um, we, we started from uh, realizing that uh, in many canteens that we had around the, 
where we live. So we are a collective uh, all around France in all the regions. Um, there was a, a very bad quality meal served in the canteens. So this is a picture of a collective of parents who uh, who made uh, who committed themselves to uh, try to change the canteens uh, of their children. And so they uh, so this is a, an action uh, that they made. They piled plastic boxes uh, taken from the canteens together, and they made the calculation, and they found out that if they piled all the plastic boxes of the Parisian canteens all together, every day it would be the size of the Triumph Arch, so you know the monument in Paris. And so they uh, started to organize collectively to change this. So of course the the quality of the meals in many uh, canteens that we can see today uh, in France is uh, is very uh, bad. There are some good, but uh, what we see on the field is that uh, there is a lot of bad quality canteens. So as you can see, it is not very appetizing. Um, these these pictures have been taken in canteens in Paris uh, in the last uh, three years. And, and of course, the, the, these came out from uh, canteens which are industrialized. Uh, they use a lot of ultra processed food. Um, it's mainly centralized big kitchens serving more than 2,000 or 3,000 meals. And it's also uh, a lot using plastic boxes because, of, of course, the, the big quantity uh, also comes with, uh, with another type of logistics which, which can uh, favor plastic. And so, um, with this uh, assessment that we made, uh, there have been uh, individuals uh, with uh, convictions uh, which met uh, in France. It was an impulsion from the government, actually, after the environment Grenelle in 2008. Um, and so they met and they connected together and, uh, and they were uh, convinced that they could really change it. And so they formed the collective and it, uh, it became the collective uh, Les Pieds en Plat, which uh, is an expression in French which basically means uh, uh, to not beat around the bushes and really go on the field and do it. Um, not, you know, uh, spending too much time uh, uh, trying to, to talk and not doing the thing, but so we are a collective of uh, doers who go on the field and do it. So it's mainly cooks, nutritionists, but also parents, politicians, school managers, academicians and there are also engineers, consultants, uh, a whole lot of, um, of actors necessary to transform the system. So of course it's a systemic and holistic approach because uh, uh, what is very interesting in, um, in collective catering projects, uh, when we want to transform a canteen, we really have to connect all the actors of the territory together uh, from the farm to the fork, so the collective of uh, organic um, farmers, uh, the cooks, the, the school managers, the parents, we, we all have to go uh, to, to be around the table and discuss and decide together what we want as a school meal for our children. So that makes it a very interesting uh, social uh, project of transformation, but it's also a challenge and so we, so, so we have to tackle all these challenges together, all together. Um, so today we are um, a collective of uh, around 160, now it's more 200 uh, professionals, so mainly cooks and nutritionists, but also, as, as I was saying, uh, more and more engineers. Uh, we also have philosophers, uh, social, sociologists, um, because um, that's what's um, very interesting about the, the food and collective catering is that it is uh, it concerns almost all the sectors of the society. Um, so we have uh, 40 professional trainers of cooks and nutritionists all around France, and we always uh, do training sessions together with one cook and one nutritionist because we believe that makes a uh, very complementary and holistic approach around the transformation of producing food. Um, so we have social educators also, economists, philosophers, um, and uh, the challenge is to, uh, to share all the knowledge together, these different actors, uh, around the, the, the challenge of feeding the, the children correctly. And we are, um, we are supported by uh, personalities, 
such as uh, Olivier Rolanger. He's a well-known uh, French three-star chef. He's also the vice president of Relais Chateau, which is a network of uh, uh, hosting uh, more like luxury, luxury gastronomy food. Um, so um, Olivier Rolanger, he, he was a three-star chef and he decided to renounce uh, his, three star, his three stars and give them back because he thought that uh, today, given our uh, environment uh, problem and crisis, Uh, we should not uh, put the, the lights only on the elite form of cooking, which uh, requires a lot of uh, cooks to, to just produce one plate, which is also quite uh, expensive, so not accessible to many people. And we should rather uh, encourage uh, the, the, the production of, uh, of food, which is uh, environmentally sustainable, socially sustainable also, and which address most of people and which is accessible for a lot of people. And so he's the godfather of uh, our collective and he helps us uh, support uh, uh, all the, the project and, uh, and yeah, support us. And also we have uh, Brigitte Mercier Fichot, who is a pioneer, pioneer organic nutritionist. So she was one of the first nutritionists uh, studying the, the subject of organic products. And uh, so these people also help us spread the message in, uh, in, in institutions Uh, which, uh, which need to, to also hear that it is possible to do differently. So what we, what we promote as uh, school meals is that, uh, of course, it's good first. It's, uh, it's uh, delicious. It's, uh, the taste has to be uh, good. Um, so we have to train. That's why we have to train the cooks, because it's not only about um, doing more vegetarian meals, And, uh, and using good product, it has to be also good to be so, so that the, the, the change, the transition is uh, appetizing also. Um, and so we, we promote organic and local products. Um, what we see is that uh, even though there are a lot of um, uh, apprehension often by the collectivities, the, the public collectivities, because they think Uh, they don't have enough organic uh, food around the, their uh, their collectivity. Um, we we actually realize that uh, uh, most of them don't know the the collective products that they have the, the organic products that they have around their collectivities. And so far, we've transformed uh, many uh, schools, nurseries, middle school, high schools. We've always uh, managed to find um, enough organic products uh, around. And also, we can organize. To make um, to develop the organic products around the collectivity if needed, and also it has to be homemade. So we always uh, transform contents by promoting homemade meals um, because uh, it's also one of the issue to uh, revalorize the, the the profession of cook, which is not always the case today, because in many canteens they don't really cook anymore; they only assemble some. Uh, products which are um, often frozen or ultra processed. So what we've done so far is that uh, in France, we certified the first 100% canteens in France. So the first uh, primary school was in 2013. Uh, and then the first middle school, uh, it was in 2018. Uh, we also did the second middle school in 2019 and the third in 2020. Uh, each time we take less uh, time to transform them. So, for example, uh, the last one that we transform, it is the fourth one. Uh, we did it from 0% organic, local and homemade to 100% um, by uh, in three months. So it's actually possible and we can do it faster and faster. Um, and we also did the first central kitchen, which is which was the first, uh, which was a small one, like uh, 1,500 meals per day. And by the example, we show that it's actually not more expensive uh, to do it, to do it in 100% organic, local, and homemade. For the local part, it's more actually about 80%, because of course we also uh, put uh, bananas and chocolate and. Uh, we, 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 we think it's also a good idea to, to have them in, in the canteens. So the price of the primary products we serve uh, is around uh, 180 euro and 2 euros 
for the primary products, so the, the cost of the, the primary pro primary products. Um, so what we can see today is that there is a, an increasing awareness of canteens as a great lever for systemic change, because um, it uh, it wasn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't understood like this by many public officials that the canteen is actually a very interesting lever to activate to promote a better food for all in general um, because it uh, touches many many dimensions of the society um, so what we do is we train the trainers also so we trained 50 trainers uh, last year uh, we organize uh, uh, public events to promote, uh, to, sensibilize, to, sen sensitivi to sensitivize, sorry, about the subject. And we also create the tools, so uh, of course recipes, but also nu nutrition tools uh, to, to, to share the knowledge and so that everyone can do it. Um, so today we have trained 6,500 6, professionals all around France. Uh, we train the 25 new trainers per year. And uh, of course, the 100% homemade, organic and local is a political stance uh, because we believe the, the interest also of uh, canteen projects is that it, uh, it uh, allows to deliver a political message, message that is quite strong to say that it is possible actually to feed the, ch the children healthily and to promote uh, uh, sustainable agriculture uh, production. Uh, and it's not more expensive. And so maybe we can start here at the level of a small village or a department or a region. Uh, today, for example, uh, the, the best example we have is in Dordogne. It is a department in, uh, in south of France. And we are transforming the 35 uh, middle schools of the of the Dordogne territory into 100% homemade, local and organic. So of course it's a systemic project and uh, we realize that it's not more expensive and that uh, uh, the cooks are happy because they cook again and that the children are happy also because it's good and, uh, and healthy for them. So um, now I have finished, I think I've done 15 minutes around. And thank you for your attention and uh, I can take a few questions if you have. Thank you Thank so you much, so Louis. I have so many questions. <laughs> you were talking, you were just talking about the children. What's their feedback? Let me know. Do they actually love the food? Uh, do they uh, enjoy eating, or they do they leave more food in the on the plate? Uh, how does it work on the field? Well, of course, uh, it requires education. Um, so. At first, there can be a uh, resistance uh, mm -hmm. for children who are not used to uh, uh, these, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, vegetables and vegetables that they have never seen or never tasted. Um, but uh, then the, the whole training is also not only the, the cooking techniques, but also how we serve the food and how we communicate with the children to, uh, to, to make them understand what they are eating, what they have in the plate and educate their taste also. Mm -hmm. They can get used to uh, these uh, fresh products and vegetables. Uh, uh, of course, it, it takes time to educate and, and change the, the, the habit, but uh, uh, our, so far what we, what we see in the canteens is that uh, it's really appreciated. And uh, when they see uh, the, the cook who made the, the plates very happy to serve the, what they did and communicate with the children, then they're happy also and they finish their plate. Basically. Well, it it actually it takes uh, effort from us to um, train the cooks and um, involve the children with them, with what they would be eat, seeing in their plates after the the, the training, right? So they don't uh, get that as a surprise. Um, looking at the, the the cooks, are they? Um, open to to getting those uh, new um, recipes, new uh, cooking habits? Are they free to learn that or are they obliged to? Uh, meaning, um, is it something they will be doing during their working hours or it's something they do after their job finishes? How does it work? 
Yes, so same as the children, it takes uh, expertise and time and knowledge to uh, make them change and change their habit. But uh, with a method and uh, an expertise, we can do it. So we've managed to do it in many, in all the situations that we encounter. So it can be uh, middle school, uh, primary school, high school, uh, nurseries, even retirement homes. Um, basically, we, the, the training we do is that we, uh, we empower the cooks to retake their skill of cooking again in their canteen, which is not often the case. So uh, when they do it and they do it with the team they have with them, it actually doesn't take more time and it doesn't require more cooks. We've calculated that in the, at the level of a territory. So it's around uh, uh, two cooks for 100 uh, meals and uh, one cook supplementary for every 100 meals supplementary. So basically three cooks for 300 meals. It's an approximation, it's an average. Um, so it doesn't take more time or more uh, cooks to do homemade and organic and local actually and yeah. it's also, it's a motivation also for them it gives them motivation to really cook something good and serve them to to children and to see them happy that's that's something a little bit different from our reality i believe um one question pops to my head and then i'll i'll, I'll jump to the questions that uh, are being um asked here in the teams chat who subsidizes this, this uh, project? Who pays for this? Can we uh, can we know that? Uh, I mean, is it the government? Uh, how does it work? Is it the schools? Yes. So the projects the, the I've talked I've been talking about, for example, in Dordogne, in the level of the thirty five middle schools in in Dordogne, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a public service. It's a public food services. Uh, so, uh, as I as I told you, it, it, so the way in France we calculate the cost of the canteen meals is by the primary product cost. So that's uh, the, the the degree of evaluation. Uh, and so, from example, we have uh, done the calculation. Uh, it's around 180 and two euros per meal, which is the the average actually of all the canteen meals in France. So that's why we say it's not more expensive. And so also the cost of the of the people working in the cooks, uh, we don't need more cooks to do this transformation. So it's really uh, a question of transformation, training, and it requires expertise and, uh, and yeah, it's, a, it's a project. But uh, the training, the training and your work and uh, the, the collective uh, personnel, who pays for that? I mean, it has to come from somewhere because you're uh, oh, yeah, giving yeah. hours to the project. Yeah. Yes. So, so yes, it's the public uh, institutions. So okay. it can be a township, it can be a department, it can be a region mm -hmm. who pays for the the service of, uh, of uh, yeah training uh, the, the, the whole system. Okay, okay, yeah. interesting. So we have a uh, one of the questions. I think it was already answered. Uh, in the question was, I was wondering if you found a relationship between food quality and eating habit of the children. I believe. You, uh, you, uh, or you might want to add something to this question? Um, I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, if you found the relationship between food quality and eating... ...habits of the children also improved they they were uh, um opened to the new, new uh, recipes the new ingredients oh. with a little bit of education right yes yes uh, so it's um it's a whole project also to educate the children and to yes. train yes. the people who serve the plates who serve the meals to do it correctly because what mm -hmm. you see on the field is that uh, many times the people who serve the place, they do it in a way that is, of course, very uh, not uh, appetizing and not encouraging for children to appreciate it. Yes. So, yes. Uh -huh. uh, so what we see is that really when we do the, the good communication and the good way to serve the plate, it actually changes everything and um, a, a child can 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 go directly from uh, uh, finding it disgusting or whatever to, oh, I love it. Because actually, I know 
the person, the cook who is be, who is behind the plate, and and he presented it well, and so he can he wants to enjoy it actually. And we, we can really see this difference. It's true. One last question. To make your project work, it requires availability of local produce and good connections with local producers. How do you ensure that logistics? This is crucial, right? Yes. To have the availability of the product so the meals can be uh, presented and prepared. Yes. How does it work? Question. So, um, it, it has to be a systemic uh, project and change, as I said in the beginning. So, of course, we, at the same time, we train the cooks uh, and we inform the public officials on the way to, to bring forth the product. We have also to organize the logistic and the production of the, of the, the, the vegetables and the, the meat and everything. And so, for this, in, the, in Dordogne, for example, so in the territory of Dordogne, we created a platform of distribution uh, in, in partnership with a professional logistician who was already implemented on the territory, so who knew all the network and the, the, the logistical expertise to do it. And so we did a partnership with them and, and, and local producers to create a platform who then distribute all the organic products in all the canteens in Dordogne. And so this is a very operating and working system. And for the production part, to have sufficient uh, production of each category of food, uh, we actually planify the need in advance uh, because we do a, a food planning and we know actually how many tons of uh, carrots, how many tons of cereal we need per year. And so then the, the whole production is, uh, is efficient and can work well. That is beautiful. Uh, we. Have Thank you for so much for your time. We know we'll, you will have to leave now. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a pleasure to meet you and see your presentation. We will be following um, Le Collective de uh, the Pied on the Pla uh, work. So, uh, and now we will pass the floor to our next speaker, Katie Wilson by Jui. Katie, Thank would you, you like to, to share your screen? Sure, just one minute. And what a wonderful presentation that was. It's true, it's true. Um, okay, let's see. I, I hoped we, mm. we learned uh, a little bit from, the, from their experience. Um, yes, and I think what we'll find is here. Yeah, it was it was wonderful to learn all of those things and the good work that's going on in France. And I think what we'll find is that we have some of the same challenges. That's what's so good about these kinds of uh, webinars uh, to share information with one another. Um, so I am delighted to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Katie Wilson and I um, am the Executive Director for the Urban School Food Alliance. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfectly. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit about the systems changes in school food in the United States and particularly the organization that I represent uh, and some of the things that we're doing to move to more of a sustainable program. Because as you know, in the United States, the School Nutrition Program <clears throat> is a national program funded by the federal government. And so we have the impact of serving probably 35 to 40 million children a day. And that can be an incredible impact on the whole issue of sustainability and where this food is coming from. But the Urban School Food Alliance, the, the nonprofit that I am the executive director for, our mission is to leverage our collective voice to transform school meals. And we just think that because we are the largest districts in the country, we have not only an obligation, um, but also the ability to make sure that some of these transformations are taking place. So we are 18 of the largest public school districts in the country. Um, collectively, we offer meal services to nearly 4.2 million children a day, and that's about 715 million meals per year. Annually, our districts spend approximately $920 million on food, so we're very close to a $1 billion in U.S. dollar spend. But I think it's also important to show that our local procurement is anywhere from $4.5 million to $33 million a year, depending on the district size. And so most of this, of course, is in produce. And um, these are the kinds of things that we try to work on in, in our alliance with our group. And so 
some of the things that we um, do is we, we talk about what's the increasing influences. What changes people's mindset? We might know what's best for sustainable food systems. We might know that local is the best way to go, organic, uh, regional, because not only is it better food, but it also reduces environmental impact. But how do we look at influences in this system? First, we look at dietary patterns. What's happening across our country in the ways that people eat? Um, the food system as a whole, how do people get access to good food? That's a real concern for us because our system is so vast and there are some extremely rural areas. How do people get access to this healthy food? If the farmer is growing food, how do they get it to the market, to the canteen? How do they become part of this system if they can't produce enough for 10,000 people, they can only produce enough for 100 people. How do we get them involved in the food system? So these are all influences that all have to be taken into consideration. We look at community economics. We truly believe that more local food, more organic food, working with those local producers, that helps strengthen economies. That helps strengthen small family farms. And of course, that is good for everybody. So to keep money in the, in the community in which it should stay, when all of these canteens in our school systems belong to these communities, that's where the money should stay put. We look at public health and how does this, um, these influences change public health? We know, we know that the industrialized, highly processed food system has really impacted public health in a very negative way. Um, that sugar is my big issue. There's so much sugar in all of these products. There are so much um, preservatives and other additives in these products that we no longer need. We have a pamphlet that's available on our website called Ingredients of Concern. We don't want to see these ingredients in our food anymore. But then that brings us to this whole perception of school meals. And that's why I just loved the previous presentation when he kept speaking about how the children enjoyed it. The children were engaged in the meal. The children knew who prepared it and where it came from. And I think that changes perception of a school meal. The picture I have here is a school meal in the United States. The fruits and vegetables are the central part of that. That tray is compostable. That's another thing that we did at the Alliance is we created a compostable tray that now everybody can buy. So we take styrofoam and plastic out of the landfills. And we need to create a new narrative for school canteens. What is a school meal? And so many people have a very negative narrative that we need to all, as nutritionists and people engaged in this field, we need to start talking about cooks and chefs and professionals in the field. In the United States, we have this horrible term called lunch ladies. I absolutely despise that term. It takes it and makes it a degraded position as far as I'm concerned. So this narrative has to be different. And we have to continue to talk about school meals and school canteens are part of the solution for better food getting to our young people because we feed so many children every single day. So what's driving these food choices? We know that it has to be trendy and cool, especially for those children in their teenage years. What's, what are they excited about? What are they thinking about? We wanna really begin to rename menu items. I loved the previous speaker talked about, or no, I think uh, at the beginning, you talked about making sure that vegetables are part of the, uh, part of the name, but it's the main part of the name. And, and the protein item is falling more towards the side of the name or the lesser part of that name. So renaming those items. I loved this sign that I saw. Um, the positive narrative, not we're unhealthy and we need to do better. That's negative. Who wants to do that? Not me. I want to do things that are positive. So I loved this. I saw this in a, in a school with grades 9 through 12. And it said nature's amazing pharmacy. And the students were really relating to this that a sliced carrot looks like a human eye. And it also greatly enhances your blood flow to the eyes. Hmm, that makes me wanna eat carrots. Not that they're nutritious for me and I have to eat them. No, it's an, a wonderful part to keep my eyes healthy. The tomato was compared to the chambers of a heart, a walnut to the brain. And guess what? It, it, it does wonderful things to the brain when you eat more nuts and seeds and beans as a kidney shaped item that heal and help maintain kidney function. These are all positive narratives. We also really believe in experiencing growing and raising processes. 
More and more of our schools have a farm to school program. The United States government uh, provides a lot of funding to millions and millions of dollars for schools to do farm to school programs in a variety of ways. And so these young people are now learning to do this. And we know that when they have a school garden and even very young children, they help grow that tomato, they're more inclined to try it. They're more inclined to eat it because they grew it. And they begin to learn how to care for the environment. They learn about the uh, how important it is that we have healthy soil because without healthy soil, we don't have healthy food. And so all of these things become part of experiencing that growing and raising process. This lends itself for us to move more to a plant-based diet, which in the United States and in our school canteens, we're really trying to encourage. So here are some examples of some of the things that we have access to through the National Farm to School Network and some of the things that they do um, when they have the school cooks at conferences, and then they also can provide, provide these kinds of signs in their canteens. Put your money where your farmer is. It's wonderful to talk about organic, uh, more local food, but then you go to what we have this huge chain called Walmart and we go to the big chains. I know in the UK it's Tesco um, and we go to these big chains and we spend money because we want to spend less. We want our food very inexpensive, but who's paying for that? How does a farmer grow food, get it to market, keep it fresh, keep it organic and get paid less than what he's, he or she really needs to earn? So this, I love this sign about put your money where your farmer is. We must begin to understand that the farmer needs to be paid for the jobs that they're doing for us before we can get organic to become really the mainstream. It says shake the hand that feeds you. When we get children to meet the farmers and in many of our districts, the farmers actually come in and do presentations in the schools. That's a whole different message to those children and they get to know them one-on-one -on -one and the importance of farming and good quality farming that takes care of our environment in our soil. And then these other kinds of signs when, when parents come into the schools for various meetings and conferences or the children are in their canteens, this is a wonderful sign series that one of our school districts has that talks about the different seasonal produce that they have available to them. So again, it's part of making sure that there's positive messages and really introducing children to these foods. So some of our strategies in K-12, culturally appropriate meals. We have a very mixed group of people in the United States. And so we have a lot of cultures now that are teaching us more about plant-based meals and, and the, the wonderful way in which to present them. We have meatless Mondays where they take the meat, of the, the red protein, the animal protein out of the school meal completely uh, on Mondays. And they show kids a different way to eat and a different way to bring food into the canteen. Uh, we have actual vegan days. New York City just went to every Friday. Can you imagine a million meals a day in New York City? And every Friday they, they are serving a 100% vegan meal to children across the city of New York. Now there's been some struggles because it happened very quickly. And I think the, the previous presenter talked a lot about educating children as well as the cooks. None of that happened. And so New York is trying to do some catch up there where you have to educate the children. You have to have taste testing going on. You have to have the cooks understand how to prepare these meals to make sure that they're very flavorful and wonderful. We need to make sure that the flavor profile is what kids want to. We need to come together to procure like a chain restaurant. And that's what the Alliance is doing. As large as we are, um, can you imagine? We have 400 million pounds of chicken collectively within our Alliance alone. And so we can change. Right now we're in the middle of a project that's saying no antibiotics, no ingredients of concern. We don't want it fried. We have a breading recipe that is whole grain and, and less in sodium. All of these kinds of things we can come together collectively to do that changes in the marketplace. And the chicken producers, we put value statements in. How are those chickens treated? Um, uh, how many miles do they have to drive to get to our school districts to deliver? So all of these things can be written in to what we call a specification for procurement that changes that system. And then we're beginning to look at plastic-free school lunch days. The city of New York did that in May and they did again, the whole entire city, no plastic whatsoever for the school canteen. And it was amazingly successful. 
educating kids, getting kids engaged, getting parents engaged, communities engaged in what that could look like. We have people that have worked to get rid of the plastic straw in their cutlery kit. And you, you'd think that would be simple, but it was not. It was a really difficult chore. So in the Alliance, we also share, share best practices with one another so they don't have to try to do it again. They just use the practice that somebody else developed. Going forward, child nutrition policy is so critical to making this change. What is the cost? How much money are we getting for reimbursement in a child nutrition program? That's really critical. In our country, they have the reviews every three years. They have to meet the nutrition standards. So how, is, how are all these plant-based foods being credited so that they meet the nutrition standards? We need to do a lot of work and nutritionists need to play a role in this to help get that crediting up to date for a more plant-based uh, menu plan. Nutrition and food education in our schools in the United States is pretty much non-existent. There's nothing um, national, there's no standardized curriculum. It's whatever teachers believe in, which can be all kinds of things. Again, every time I talk to nutritionist organizations, I say to nutritionists, look, you've got to help develop curriculum that's easy to do in the classroom, easy for children to understand and easy for teachers to use. So that's critical. We're doing some projects where we're linking urban farmers to food hubs and our school systems to food hubs. So they are starting to use these food hubs where a small farmer, small minority farm run farms could contribute. Whether they have a small amount of tomatoes or a large amount of tomatoes, they still wanna be part of this system. And we have to work with these food hubs to connect them to the school canteen for better procurement processes, particularly in our large urban areas where they need large quantities of food. Food waste education in schools is also a great big part of this, I think. Good food doesn't get wasted. Time to eat is also very important. In our school system, sometimes children only have up to 10 minutes, can you imagine, to get into the canteen, get food, sit down, eat it, and they're blowing the whistle for them to go outside to play. We've got to look at this as part of the experience. And again, we share best practices with one another. So developing a plan, taking small steps, bringing those stakeholders together, who's all involved in this process, from the community, the banks in your community that help support initiatives, that farmer, those local food hubs, reimagine their language and the messaging. How are we educating people, engaging them, exciting them about eating better and putting better things in their cart in the grocery store, which then celebrates the success that's going on in the school canteen. We've got to convince parents also that this is the way to go because they support children in participating in those programs. So I just wanna share this as I close. This is a toolkit that's really exciting that was done through the Culinary Institute of America and a number of our major universities, Edgy Veggies Toolkit. It really is how to incorporate taste-focused labeling to encourage healthier eating. It's a wonderful toolkit and it's available free of charge online. And then I'll close with this slide. This is actually an ambulance that's at one of our huge uh, farmers markets in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, they actually, this is an organic farm and this is how they travel around with their um, organic produce to sell at farmers markets and to sell to school canteens. And one of our good friends uh, in, in our school canteens, she's a chef. She said, this is not the time to force yourself to do the things you always did. It's not working. Accept that and give yourself permission to do it differently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. I I have to appre I appreciate your presentation. I have to apologize because I have a, a construction site here on my building, so you might uh, hear some uh, horrible noises. But um, uh, some questions. I have two kids my uh, myself. And I know at first they might refuse the new ingredient, the new food. They might even roll their eyes, but we have to keep pushing until uh, it becomes a habit, until that new ingredient uh, uh, starts to uh, being uh, um, a, a pleasant moment. And they not only learn their eating habits at school, but they learn their eating habits uh, at home with their parents. We are uh, major influencers for our kids. So uh, this education 
um, how is it involving the parents, not only the school, but also the parents? Tell us uh, more about uh, your example, Katie. Sure, and what we have in research, it shows that children need 15 times to be exposed to something before they actually accept it, okay? So 15 times. But what we also encourage though, when I showed those signs, um, we also encourage take homes for children. So if you're introducing a new vegetable, many times we have harvest of the month. And so if you're introducing a new vegetable that month into your school system and into your canteen, and I'll take eggplant, for example. In our, where I live in Western Wisconsin, it's meat and potatoes. And so when they introduced eggplant, they put a sheet of paper um, with what it looks like. How do you buy it? How do you prepare it? Because parents aren't going to go buy it if they don't know that you might have to peel it. Or how do you store it? So all of these pieces of information are on a single sheet of paper. And then a recipe, a home recipe, is also on that take-home flyer for children. So they like to send those home or they'll use technology now and put it in an app or on their website or text it out to parents. That has become highly successful so that our huge conglomerate Walmart that's in every community in America actually asked our small local school district where I live, please tell us what the vegetable of the month is because we have parents coming into the store asking for eggplant and they never carried eggplant in the past. And so you must engage. And, and we know that children drive a lot of parents' purchases as well. And so you must engage in those things. We also have something really relatively new that's really working well in the United States and that we have nutritionists in our grocery stores where people go to buy food for their families. And so a nutritionist can go with you as you're shopping that day and help you make some of these better choices. So they're connected to the school canteens as well as to what's going on. So you must inform parents so that they, they become part of this as well. It's true. And uh, I, I, I have another question here from Katarina Vasconcelos, which you know. She said in, in our last webinar, one of the conclusions from uh, Professor Mason from UK was that in a, a politician level, we want to include uh, environmental aspects in the guide, in nutrition guidelines from the government. In USA, um, the School Food Alliance um, is it? They they're doing an incredible job, the, but the process is the opposite. In what way do they influence the guidelines? Is it government working in that way? Meaning, who who makes the guidelines? Who goes first? So the government does. We have the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, um, which is an, a public uh, document that people guides people on which how they're going to eat or recommendations for how they should eat. Um, when I was at the USDA, I was very disappointed because they put a climate piece into that because every five years it's updated and that was removed um, because they said it was outside of the scope. But I think there's a movement. There's a big grassroots movement to do something better. So with the Alliance, because we're so large, uh, we can put into our requirements, we can have all of our districts, like the chicken project that we're working on, we're saying no antibiotics, we're saying no ingredients of concern. We're also saying how many miles does this product have to ride in a vehicle? So what's the CO2? Um, all of these pieces, we as public entities, we can make, we can force change because if we do it with the Alliance, simply because we're all the largest districts in the country, because we have, we have Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Dallas, Texas, Miami, all these very large districts. What we do, the rest of the marketplace will follow because those food processors, they can't make different things for smaller districts. They're going to make what we want. So we can change that and we force that issue to happen. And the government's going to have to catch up to us um, because there still isn't enough policy on climate change and what this is doing to the environment. It's true. One last question. So before we uh, we jump to our next uh, uh, speaker, with the implementation of these initiatives, do you found that the food waste is reduced? Meaning, are the children also more conscious about they what they actually need to eat from their plates and do not leave any uh, any food left? 
Yes, you know, we're really educating children a lot on food waste. Um, we're taking on some initiatives. There's even some new technology that to today, we're having a call this afternoon with our membership and the company from this new technology that can be used in both the preparation kitchen as well as out in the canteen to educate children more about food waste. Um, and we are, I, I think children too are beginning to think about this. We started it with that plastic free day where let's eliminate plastic. Uh, this is what's in your landfill. I loved the picture of all the plastic trays in France. Uh, that when you when you compare it to the arch, okay, that says something to somebody. Somebody gets that. They understand that. So those are the kinds of things we're talking about. But then we're looking at using some technology in some of our districts as well that the child will put their tray before they dump it on a scale and put in its vegetables, protein, and milk. And then it'll read out very quickly, generally, what, okay, what, how much water was used? What's the CO2 of this? And how much gas will be produced in the landfill because you're going to throw this away? We also have something called offer versus serve. We serve, we offer five components to a meal, the different food groups, and the children only have to take three out of the five. They can take all five, but they only have to take three. So that also really reduces food waste a lot for us. It's true. And, uh, we uh, have to measure in order to manage. We cannot uh, manage what it, we don't measure. So it's, we have to make the children, we have to, uh, they have to be able to see um, what happens to the food they don't eat. Uh, what's the cost of it, the hidden cost of it. Thank you so much, Katie, for your beautiful presentation and uh, keep up with the, the uh, wonderful work. Uh, we'll now pass the floor to Margarida Gomes. Thank you, Margarida. The floor is yours. You can now start sharing your screen. Uh, hello, I think you can already. Yes, we can see the, the see PowerPoint. It, it's in presentation now. Yes, it's working. It's okay, I think. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Very interesting presentations before about this subject. Uh, my perspective here is to talk about education. Uh, I am from an uh, NGO that is uh, uh, ABAI and uh, we have different programs. So we will, I will talk about uh, uh, food in uh, two programs, ECO21 that is for municipalities and ECO schools program that is for schools and uh, from uh, all ages of, of students. Uh, so, beginning with uh, our organization, we are an uh, NGO from an uh, international family of NGOs, all connected with the same programs that are these first four uh, programs for education, for sustainability, with different stakeholders. We are now talking about the, the school uh, project that is Eco Schools, but the, the, the projects began in Portugal uh, in last uh, years. We are now uh, doing 25 years of Eco Schools and launching another program that is for universities, that is the Eco Campus. All these programs and the uh, projects aim uh, to uh, to achieve three uh, uh, points, if you, if you, if you want, uh, the knowledge, the uh, action and the reward or the, a positive approach uh, emphasizing the best practice. These are the teams that we are uh, connected with the, the FEE International. So the, the, the three main topics until 2030, it's to reduce pollution, act for climate and protect biodiversity. Beginning with ECO, ECO 21 program, this is a program for municipalities. It's like an evaluation tool of their uh, 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 their actions, <coughs> their projects, and it uh, um, it concerns different topics. Uh, but the education for sustainability it's one of the most uh, important in all these indicators. Uh, we also want to disseminate best practices in, with this program, contribute to local sustainability indicators and uh, 2030 ag agenda, and of course recognize the progress uh, and celebrate this progress. Um, it works in a complex way, I'm not going to explain, but uh, it with lots of, uh, of juries that uh, uh, evaluate the information and then uh, every year uh, the, the best municipalities are recognized with a flag. Uh, 
for uh, for this uh, process, uh, we have 21 indicators, and as you can see, food is uh, present in three indicators. So the one that it's education for sustainability, LC and wellness, and also agriculture and sustainable rural de development. In these three indicators, uh, we uh, the municipalities. Uh, uh, tell uh, or express what they they did uh, towards uh, uh, the sustainability uh, targets, and uh, we we brought some uh, examples. One from Sintra. Uh, it's a project that is connected with education in schools, uh, uh, weekly food uh, education sessions, and uh, uh, with uh, some partners uh, like uh, nutritionist families and FAO. And also another example in Torres Vedras, uh, there are both uh, Eco 21 municipalities, and this is a more uh, organized uh, project. As if you if you want to, they have sessions, information sessions, also. Uh, some uh, distribution of fruit and vegetables, study visits to markets and, and uh, local producers, and so on. So, coming to Eco Schools, uh, that uh, is the, the biggest, uh, the widest network we have uh, now with more than 2,000 two schools uh, engaged from uh, kindergarten to university. Uh, in, in this uh, program, the idea is. Uh, to transform uh, 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 through action. I mean, uh, with hands-on activities, with uh, uh, action-based learn learning projects, uh, they uh, they work uh, with the, with the, uh, in the school with the stakeholders to to make a better school, if you want, a more sustainable school. Uh, all the schools in the world uh, <coughs> have the same methodology. This program is present as you can see here, in 70, uh, 74 countries. Um, and the, the, the methodology is the seven steps that I will not explain here, but it's it's a, a way to go to, to, to and to evaluate all the actions uh, during the year. Uh, the uh, areas that they work are very different. Every year they, they work water, waste and energy. This year, outdoor and playgrounds and also uh, biodiversity, uh, it's a, a team. Uh, LC and sustainable food, as you can see, is also a working team for eco schools, uh, and some of them uh, go on with that. <laughs> now I will present you two projects in eco schools that are uh, uh, directly connected with food. Uh, these projects are launched by uh, ABAI to the schools, and so they uh, can uh, be or can have uh, methodology and some resources. Can we, we motivate them for some teams and recognize also the good, uh, the good practice and the good works? The teams are uh, these ones, and as you can see, healthy and sustainable food is one of them. And uh, this began with organic vegetable gardens. Uh, for these, uh, the ideas, uh, 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 the main uh, the main objective is to learn about organic production by by planting, by taking care of of the gardens, and uh, also prom promoting <coughs> healthier food. As you can see, this project began in, in uh, 2012, and uh, uh, go is is growing. It's growing <laughs> in in the with the pandemic. Uh, we we uh, decided to, that at home they should go on with activities. So we we uh, spread some ideas to do their own works with the parents and at home, and it grew a lot because of that. But now we we have about 742 schools working in this project. Uh, they have big and small gardens. They also uh, uh, work with other related activities like the insect hotel or the rheumatic spiral or uh, they also uh, uh, work uh, or, or produce some gamification materials, illustrations about things connected with agriculture. Here are some examples of what they did during pandemic uh, at home with their parents. So they learned about insects that are present in the garden or they grew a small, a small uh, vegetable garden at home. And uh, last, I will talk to you about the <coughs> 
this uh, project that is healthy and sustainable food, so it's directly connected with food. Uh, the main objective is to educate for healthier and sustainable food through communication and hands-on activities in school and in family. That's very important, the family here, because as you said before, uh, parents are the, the, the greatest influencers for schools, uh, for kids, and uh, they can learn us at school, but if they don't have it at home, it doesn't go. So uh, now we have about 40, uh, 400 schools engaged uh, this year. We also uh, have had lots of activities during the pandemic uh, with the uh, home activities. Uh, in this project, <coughs> Uh, we also um, launched some workshops during pandemic online workshops and we have we have them online if you want to, to check some of them uh, we with the, with the family uh, during pandemic uh, the idea was that students uh, cook with their family and also that look at the waste that the family produces during three days and also if they can they make a receipt with uh, using this uh, uh, not food waste, but the, the, the food that could be a food waste. <clears throat> also, other other kind of strategies to to these teams like uh, uh, storytelling. So they create a story about the food trip, where the, where the food comes from. And this year, uh, the fish was the the main theme. But also, you can hear uh, uh, can see here uh, a work from last year that a banana talks with uh, an orange uh, and about footprint. Uh, food. Uh, we also um, had this uh, uh, Mediterranean diet as a, a topic uh, because, uh, because uh, as you know, uh, we, we have it as a <coughs> world heritage and uh, uh, so the idea is that the schools understand what it does mean, uh, what are the principles and uh, how to follow. So they, they, they made videos and some uh, uh, also posters about about that. Other other kind of strategies is is to analyze the the food they they like to eat or they usually eat uh, how how much uh, grass or how much sugar there's on it and they make a panel to be near the place there uh, the canteen uh, normally and to understand uh, some topics about uh, some problems like uh, like uh, salt or sugar for instance. Uh, we also have the canteen brigade. The canteen brigade has to take care of, take care of the meals in order to uh, the the right dose, not not too much uh, food, not too less, uh, not uh, uh, take care of compost, reduce noise, and so on. Watch their hands, so it's. Uh, to make healthier and more interesting meals in the canteen. And at least uh, we have this project Echo Cooks, uh, where we incentivize the schools to uh, make, uh, to create a, a recipe or a, a menu uh, that can be um, used in a school. Uh, so and produced in a school. So they perform live, they cook live uh, this menu. And I'm, I'm going to just to, to finish with a, a small demonstration of this project. I hope it goes now. It's working. Yes. Beautiful. É um concurso importante, acho que para todos nós a alimentação saudável é uma coisa importante, até na, é um tema muito falado atualmente, para nós cozinheiros do futuro e para eles cozinheiros que vão ser também do futuro. Este tipo de desafios são desafios impactantes para eles, são desafios que os colocam numa outra dimensão. Os nossos miúdos, alguns deles têm algumas histórias de vida menos bem conseguidas e este tipo de desafios e de conquistas projetos para uma outra dimensão, uma dimensão de, de ganhadora e por isso nós estamos sempre de alma e coração neste, neste tipo de iniciativas. Eu não tinha assim grande experiência na cozinha antes de vir ao concurso de cozinheiros. Quando me disseram que eu vinha, eu deitei as mãos à cabeça e pensava, ai Jesus, não sei cozinhar nada, mas aprendi, aprendi a cozinhar, a desenvencilhar me na cozinha, uh, hoje até estava trabalhada a fazer as coisas rápido demais, 
Por isso, acho que foi muito bom este concurso, ensina-nos muitas coisas. Consegue conciliar uh, a temática da, do consumo sustentável, da, da redução da pegada ecológica, por exemplo, no transporte dos produtos e do consumo local, que é sempre importante, fazendo a ligação entre aquilo que é uh, o nosso dia-a-dia -dia de, de alimentação com o ambiente. Para os alunos foi um desafio porque eles tiveram, portanto, e estão a ter a possibilidade de meter em prática todos os conteúdos programáticos a que constam no, nos modos que são lecionados durante os três anos do curso. Uma atividade que permite desenvolver uma série de competências que normalmente em contexto de sala de aula não desenvolvem, nomeadamente a autonomia, de escolhas alimentares, por exemplo, porque são eles que fazem essa seleção de alimentos que vão escolher. A experiência aqui no Ecoescolas foi brutal e ensinaram-nos a cozinhar muito melhor e além disso temos um júri bacana. Um, um dos pilares da nossa estratégia de responsabilidade corporativa um, que está focado na alimentação saudável e no fundo promover a saúde através da alimentação portanto é exatamente uh, esse o nosso desígnio aqui ao apoiar este projeto. E queremos que quanto mais escolas se juntarem, quanto mais vezes participarem neste projeto, melhor. Vamos fazer da sustentabilidade e da saúde pela alimentação uh, o nosso compromisso nacional. E pronto, uh, and so, sorry, um, that's all, I think. Thank you so much. I believe in this. In the by the end of the uh, the video, we can we can understand who funds this uh, program. Is it uh, is it um, public food? Is it um, partnerships? Uh, is it uh, um, sponsors? Yeah, it's uh, it's sponsors. <laughs> it's the sponsors the and partners. The credits uh, from the and video. partners. We have as partners, we have, for instance, uh, NGO AgroBio, we have uh, uh, the, the um, Education uh, Ministry and also um, the Environmental uh, uh, Institution, is, yes, Institute. And um, yeah, we as a sponsor, we have Jerónimo Martins, uh, and it's with it's that uh, sponsoring that we can uh, organize all these uh, yeah these show cookings all these prizes because all the activities then they have prizes and and all this yes i have already had the the the, the chance to be in a school where your program is running and this food education and uh, i could see it for myself that the kids actually love these activities because for once they are a different day uh, at school not um, um, being in the classroom with their teachers, like everyday uh, activities, they're doing something different. And usually they learn better from people outside the, the school. And uh, especially when they have the chance to put, uh, to, to get their hands dirty, you know, to experience something. So the, the exper experimental part of the learning is uh, actually more effective than just um, uh, learning uh, in the classroom. So uh, I guess this is the answer to my question. What makes this program so effective? I mean, here in Portugal, you already uh, are present in 200 schools. I was thousand, looking for... Two thousand. Two sorry, <laughs> yes. I apologize. I was looking for the same program in Brazil, for example, and they yeah, have uh, this they have it, really... Yes really small uh, um, number of schools. So yeah. what makes this so su su successful here in our reality, in our country? Yeah, 
uh, well, comparing with Brazil, they began maybe seven years ago, six mm -hmm. years ago, and we, we are doing now 25 years. So we have already uh, a, lot. <laughs> a long way then. And uh, we have learned with this, with, with all this time, the best way to engage schools, municipalities, stakeholders. Uh, but I think the, 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 the best thing uh, is uh, learning by doing. That's the secret for me. Uh, the students are engaged when they experience, when they see that uh, what they do, they can, it can be, uh, can make a difference. Uh, when their voice is heard and, and they have to, the citizenship is very important in this program, so they, they have to, to tell what they want to do, to, to check, to verify, to see the results. And uh, yeah, I think for me, it's uh, running by doing is the secret. Of course, that we also the uh, uh, the partnerships is very they are very important to to launch all this to make it happen. Not only for us, but for for each school, they they make uh, uh, partners locally, and uh, mm -hmm. if they have good partners, so it works. Yes. Um... Once again, from my experience in the in the school I was involved, uh, I I saw the enthusiasm from the kids and I saw the commitment from the teachers. But uh, and I think you will have to agree, it takes a toll on the the on the teachers' um, working load, isn't it? Because these these are actually um, extracurricular activities they embrace in order to for the kids to be able to learn these new um, things. How does it really um, work with the with the, the teachers? Yeah. Are they um, open to to having uh, these other responsibilities, this extra load of work? Yes. Uh, the the extra load of work is what we hear every day, of course. But yes. actually, the activities don't need to be extracurricular. Uh, okay. The idea is that they work in, in the curriculum with the, in different subjects, inter, in, inter subject, uh, and you work. Of course, there are there are some uh, uh, actions that they have to to do. Some very uh, some. Uh, yeah, sometimes they have to spend more time, but uh, then uh, it's the direction of the school that must uh, must understand that uh, the importance of this work because it's not one project; it's a whole school project approach. So, and they they have to to make it a timetable of the teacher to recognize that uh, in its time to work this this uh, this way this way especially this way, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we that's our fight. Some some schools do it, some schools not so much, uh, but that's why, uh, that's what we are always underlining. That's important that uh, teachers have time to, to run the program because it, because it takes time, yes. It does, it, it does, it does take time and, uh, and uh, commitment to, to have these programs working in the schools. Uh, I was taking a look at the chat. Uh, um, there was actually one question um, to Katie, and she has already uh, answered it. Uh, she written the, the answer, but I, I believe it's good for us to hear the, the answer, the question and the answer from Katie, so it gets recorded here in the session. So the uh, question is, um, we can agree that uh, at least we can choose uh, regarding to, to putting our money in the farmer or in the pharmacy. We can choose to agree to whom we give our money to, but taking the Portuguese reality, we do not have the size to achieve such a powerful position towards the food industry, industry yet, maybe. Furthermore, the price of a school meal does not currently support organic meals. What advice could you give to a small municipality in Portugal to start a revolution as you did in the US? Great Katie. question. Um, thank you for that question. And uh, I think a revolution can start very small. It doesn't have to be a large municipality. So, um, and, and when you talk about putting food into the farmer instead of pharmacy, we also have a number of our large grocery stores actually accepting prescriptions for fruits and vegetables in their pharmacy rather than medications. So that's also mm -hmm. a grassroots thing that's starting. But I think you start with what we saw from the other presenters as well, these school gardens. You get these young children engaged, um, just like uh, we just heard about, and they will help start your revolution for you. 
Uh, just like I said, when, when we were doing eggplants in a small rural town in Wisconsin, no one had heard or seen an eggplant before. And then the large grocery stores were saying, please tell us, what is it you're going to talk about? What are you teaching the children? What are you exposing them to? Because they wanted their parents to buy eggplant. So I think you start with those school gardens. I think both of the other presenters also talked about the kids then begin to learn what that is. Uh, talk about soil conservation and how important that is. Talking about the fact that we don't want all these chemicals sprayed on our food. When you're growing that organic garden, uh, these foods are ready to eat. You can rinse them off and wash them off simply and eat them. But if they're sprayed with a lot of chemicals, you have to do, you might still get the chemical even ingesting it. So I think that that's where we start this revolution is getting the young people really engaged. But I also think you start small food hubs. Those farmers that have a small quantity of food that they wanna to sell to the canteen, what we found here, even in the very small uh, school districts where only a hundred people are or a thousand people are, they don't know how to sell to the canteen. They don't know what the rules are. We have some food safety rules that they have to follow in the United States. Make sure their employees have hand washing and, and restroom facilities. That's a requirement if you mm -hmm. want to sell to the institutional food systems. Um, and so they, they need to learn what those things are. So you start with, we have a many really small little food hubs where they can come to learn what are those rules and then how do they learn how to do them? Um, how, do they, how do they give their employees restrooms and hand washing facilities? There's lots of portable things you can use. Um, so the health departments in our local municipalities also help educate. But you start very, very small and you bring those stakeholders together and start that food hub that now all of a sudden 20, 30 farmers are engaged in and that canteen decision maker can come and say, I want green beans. But maybe in conversation we found out that they don't have enough green beans for that day. So why can't we have green beans and tomatoes and peas, it, why can't we have a variety rather than just green beans today? Because that farmer can't grow enough green beans for that, that meal service that day. So I think smart, starting small and creating those small community food hubs. Many times if you have a farmer's market where you can go and buy local mm -hmm. produce, who's ever organizing that can be the beginning of your food hub, so. It's true and, and for example, uh, uh, we here at Food for Sustainability, we are working with the producers, with the producers associations. We already uh, launched uh, this uh, catalog for organic producers, which is called Biolog. It's already online, biolog.pt. So we want to bring together, uh, in a way we can communicate with the producers, we engage with them to know their difficulties and to know their uh, strengths and to be able to connect them to uh, where their products are needed, uh, namely the, the school canteens, we are, which we are talking, and the schools here, which we are talking here today. Uh, considering uh, the impact, and this question can be addressed to either one, uh, either Katie or Magrida, considering the increase in the food cost that we are facing at this moment, um, how, how do you perceive the impact of this uh, uh, on our food habits? We will we'll be needing to have a more sustainable, an even more sustainable eating habits soon, sooner rather than later. Would you like to comment? I, I can, I can, I can comment. Maybe yes, uh, I, I think so. Uh, but that's my personal belief. I'm not. I don't have a scientific theory or about that. But uh, as we can see more and more, uh, and since pandemic, uh, we uh, understand uh, better that what is sustainability. And now with the war and with all these. Uh, uh, the cereals and all this, we we see how how bad uh, when we are not sustainable. So how dependent you can be, and what what can happen. So I think many I know many people that uh, uh, again uh, turn, uh, are cultivating and uh, with uh, yeah with uh, organic food. I don't know if it's already a international movement. Maybe not, but it, it's happening more and more. Yes, I believe that I believe we have to be more sustainable as soon as possible, not only in food, in energy, in everything. Yeah, it's true. Katie, would you like to 
at? Sure. And I think that I, I agree. I think the pandemic has really pulled back what I call the curtain. And this was just bound to happen. It just it just seems like the pandemic uh, made it happen a little more exponentially and a little more quickly. But I think that we're finding out in our school systems, we were we couldn't get food. We could not get food delivered into our school systems. And so we heard we, we found out loud and clear that these big industrialized uh, processors that are making industrialized um, processed food, they went to where the most the highest profit was. And that was in chain restaurants and fast food restaurants. So they stopped delivering to our school systems and, and completely. And so that's we've been scrambling trying to find food. And that's where we really got loud and clear messages that a sustainable food system mm -hmm. is closer to where it needs to be. It's, it's more people in the system, not just a few. Um, it has to be more farmers in the system so that if something happens one place, you can still get food from another. Uh, and I think that this is forcing change. And I think that's where the grassroots movement is really happening. And, and I think it is, no matter how small you are or how large you are, you answer with your money. If you personally go to the grocery store to your store and you decide what you're going to buy with your dollars, that's gonna change what they put in their store. Because if you don't buy the industrialized processed food, they don't want it sitting in their freezer and their cooler or in their store. But if you buy more of what that organic, less processed food is, they're gonna bring more of that in. So you can individually change the system. It's true. We, as consumers, uh, we um, create the consuming trends um, with, our, with our money. So I will wrap up the session. It was a true pleasure to hear your works, your um, words. Uh, I have to thank you for being here, for your time. Uh, I will remember the next week's uh, session will be our last session from this webinar cycle. We will be focusing on products and services development willing to understand the main, main challenges and innovation solutions companies are already developing to embrace a sustainable food transition. So we will see some of you next week. Uh, thank you once again. It was uh, a pleasure to have you in this one and a half hour session. Thank, thank you, you so much. much.